Elliot Norton Reviews. Mr. Norton's guests today are Angela Lansbury and George Hearn, the stars of the award-winning Stephen Sondheim musical Sweeney Todd, now playing at Boston's Metropolitan Center. Good evening. Angela Lansbury and George Hearn are the stars of Sweeney Todd, a most remarkable Broadway show which is brilliantly written with extraordinary music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and beautifully performed at the Metropolitan Center by a great cast with George Hearn as Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, and Angela Lansbury as Mrs. Lovett, who takes him in and bakes his pies. It is brilliant in all ways, and at the very same time, it's a little distressing because the pies she bakes are made from the bodies of his customers whose throat he slashes. There is wit, wisdom, skill of every conceivable theatrical kind in Sweeney Todd. There is also slaughter and a kind of jaunty cannibalism. There is comedy and wit. There's also murder and vengeance of a kind not seen on the stage since Elizabethan days. Angela Lansbury, who is giving one of the great performances of her career as Mrs. Lovett, must have some special views about the play because she originated the role of Mrs. Lovett in New York and has been playing it for a long time since. How do you feel about the play in a 40, 50, or 100 words, oh, Angela? 40, 50, 100. Uh, <laughs> how did well, you feel when you first read it? Well, I just felt it was a, it was sort of a macabre comedy, mm -hmm. really, yeah. and uh, I thought that the the subject matter was really submerged in my mind by the overlay of wonderfully romantic, tragic comedy, which yeah. is encased I within. I know, as you say, it has uh, the subject matter is is uh, makes your hair stand on end when you stop to discuss it, but. Actually, when you get down to it, it's almost by the board, I think, except for the few odd moments when you have the odd throat slitting, you know. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's the least of that's our doings. That's playing it down I mean, a little Mrs. bit. Mrs. Lovett is a heck of a good cook, <laughs> let's put it that way, when she finally gets the proper raw material to, to make her pies worthwhile. Even though I start off singing, I play, bake the worst pies in London, you, and you know. Mm. Finally, I think she gets rather good and, and gets an enormous clientele of people who are only too happy to eat her mm. pies. I love that <laughs> choral song, God, That's Good, when they're all singing about it. And yeah. we know what's in the pies <laughs> and they don't. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. That's uh, well. You thought of it after all as a great part. Oh, I did. I did. I, I. It was something. I felt that the part of Mrs. Lovett was going to be the kind of challenge that an actress of my kind, a character actress, which I am, uh, whether I like it or not, and I happen to like it. Uh, and I we like it. You <laughs> liking it? <laughs> Thank you. Right. I sort of sensed that I was going to be able to put an awful lot of very interesting ingredients into this character. And they're the there. Right word. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can't get away from the cookbook. You notice how every time I refer to any part of this show, it has to do with cooking or yeah. recipes. <laughs> uh, how did you feel, George? Did you come to it after, well, Len Carrier originated the part. Then you went into it in Broadway. Uh, had you seen Len Cario as Sweeney Todd, or did you go to it cold? I was doing a thing called uh, I Remember Mama, if you remember. I remember. <laughs> that play. I remember, at the I time, remember Mama. At uh, the time, uh, Sweeney was uh, going into New York, and uh, mm. so I hadn't seen Sweeney Todd until I knew I was going to play it. Mm. And I was devastated by Len's performance, and of course by Angela's, too, and very excited suddenly. As you say, they were great, they're great roles. They're two magnificent roles. Absolutely extraordinary in the sense that these are two characters, if you didn't have any music at all, this mm. would be two great, beautifully, uh, brilliantly Stunning. drawn characters. Well, and how did you uh, react to them? Of course, after all, it's a fat part to begin <laughs> with, isn't it? You have to react You can forgive a lot of how sins. How many sides is it? <laughs> I have no idea. I think we're off stage seven minutes in each yeah. act, something like that. The two of us were on stage constantly. And, uh, I, I was struck by other aspects of it a lot. And I s told you earlier, I, I have very low tolerance for violence in, say, in films and things. But doing a part, you get inside the feelings of the character uh -huh. that he's exploring. You know how technically the things work. 
And I found that the revenge story, the Count of Monte Cristo aspect, was extremely important. And also the fact that I think it's a great love story, or a series of love stories like Russian dolls inside of each other. And that the, the murder, this, the exploration of psychotic behavior, is the flip side yeah. when the man goes crazy. Uh, but it's driven by love and uh, revenge. It certainly is an honest play, isn't it, in yeah. the sense that he pursues what he's after. Absolutely. Now, how about her, Angela? You make her out to be a very cheerful kind of adult person. Mm -hmm. She's not really adult. She's not crazy, definitely. Is no, she? No, no, no. I think she's very canny. Mm. Uh, she's <coughs> unscrupulous. She's a woman of the gutter. Yeah. She uh, has to find her, her living the way she, as best she can. Mm. She's at right on the very edge of society, and she is really a, a, a have-not and of the dun, a downtrodden nature, but nevertheless of a very chirpy demeanor. And Is that, uh, in, let me interrupt that, because that's in your performance and has been from the beginning in New mm -hmm. York. Is that part of the character, or have you added that? I think that's something that I have uh, imbued her with, way, uh, way over and above what was on the printed page. That's exactly what I felt. Mm -hmm. You know, Very in other so. words, she could be played pretty much, you play your man pretty straight. She could be played straight as a conniving woman. Yes, very she? much so. Yes, but I, I, I felt that if I played her like that, the whole evening would just be too dark an evening. Mm. That the necessity to lighten and to make more palatable um, her relationship with wha what she was doing, and certainly to be able to uh, make honest her romantic inclinations toward Mr. Todd. Yeah. She had to be attractive enough for him to want to have her housekeep for him, which is the basis of the, their relationship. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're uh, sharing the same bed, I suppose, as well. But mm -hmm. I mean, basically, she takes him on as uh, uh, her, her <coughs> lodger, you see, mm -hmm. and gives him <coughs> quarters upstairs in the bake shop and makes uh, <coughs> him welcome. Because as it turns out, she's always loved him, you see. She's always had her eye on him. She knew him before he ever got sent off to the, the penal colony. And so mm. when he comes back, she doesn't recognize him at first because he's changed so much mm. after all those years in Australia. So she's really thrilled and excited. And she says, my God, it is you, Benjamin Barker, because she realizes this is the man she always had her eye on. Mm. So she, of course she does everything possible to ingratiate herself with him. Mm. And the difference between George's performance, I think, and Len's, which is, uh, we, we've discussed the, the two, was that, uh, I had a far more difficult time getting Len to look my way. And the oh. difference now with George, which is marvelous, is that we're playing t we play together much, much more mm. because his characterization allows him to give the time of day to Mrs. Lovett. Mm. And he uh, is prepared to put up with her carryings on, and he doesn't put her down as swiftly. If you know Stephen, I mean. Stephen asked me that. Uh, and it, it that to show the vul as much Stephen vulnerability. Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim had said, don't just, if you can, try not to get monochromatic about it and have him just raging all the time. Try to, find, try to show us the vulnerabilities, his mm -hmm. capacity to love. His, uh, and and then, he, then when he flips out in the song called Epiphany and then the very end of Act One, uh, he's, you've got somewhere to go. You know, mm -hmm. To be furious from the beginning is one note and, and it won't sustain it. Well, from the beginning, he is obsessed, oh, yes. is he not? When you walk on the stage, he oh, definitely yes. is obsessed. Yes, indeed. This is a man who carries that feeling of hatred toward, well, hatred toward humanity, isn't that it? That's that, but I think it's more that he is a, has a specific complaint. He, he, was, he was treated badly by a judge and, uh, yeah. and his sheriff, and uh, he's come back to find his wife, and he has a series of... of setbacks and when she finds out that he thinks he finds out that his wife is dead and the judge who sent him off has now adopted his child, his daughter. And then he, he's going to get revenge on two people. He's going to kill two people. Mm -hmm. He gets the judge in the chair. He gets interrupted as a friend walks in and the judge escapes and then he flips out, as we say now, into, into saying, now I'm going to kill everything that moves. Mm -hmm. So there's a progression mm -hmm. through the play. But that's, a, mm, but that's a potential as you come on stage. Oh, sure. There's a hatred there that's extraordinarily deep right from the beginning, isn't yes. there, as a result of what he's seen? I think so. Yeah. And felt. Mm. Mm -hmm. Harold Prince, now this seems to me to be one of the most 
Well, with all Prince showed, I think his control of the stage, his manipulation of people is extraordinary. Did he accept your idea of making her kind of jolly cockney? Yes, uh, up to a certain point. He was always afraid I was going to go over the edge. In a making her a clown? Making her, uh, didn't want a caricature, which I certainly didn't either. Yeah. But it's a very fine line in a piece of material of this sort. Yeah. <coughs> and I do, at times, resort to a lot of uh, uh, musical, uh, English musical shtick. I yeah. do it in uh, Have a Little Priest yeah. because I think this is the moment that, that one can take off and I think uh, in the musical theatre you have to pick your times to do certain things and I picked that time to do it mm -hmm. and neither Hal or Steve took a, uh, exception to that nor did they object mm -hmm. as long as I kept it fairly well within certain confines. Mm -hmm. would the be temptation late. must be to kick it around. Oh yeah, you don't have to be very careful. I, was I could kick it around a lot more, but I don't want to. Mm. I, uh, or maybe I should, I don't know. Often I don't I wonder. think so, no. I think you have to play it on the nose. Mm -hmm. You do with that Have a Little Priest. Now, that to me is a disturbing song. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, <coughs> this is the way the show affects me. The whole show is in that particular uh, song there. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant piece of music hall comedy, mm -hmm. isn't it, the mm -hmm. song? Absolutely. This is the point at which you decide you decide for him what you how you're going to dispose of the bodies, mm -hmm. and it's it's a uh, it's almost Gilbert and Sullivan. A lot of the lyrics, yes. I think, are Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever in America has ever written with that freshness, that inventiveness, that fluency mm -hmm. as Sondheim does here. But you really keep going into it, don't you? Into well, detail, we do. Oh, yes, indeed. including one corny joke of the kind Sondheim almost never makes about the general. About the general. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's not. That's not the Sondheim, the one I expect from Sondheim. But that's where you go into music hall. But there again, you see, when I'm repelled by the subject matter and what the two of you are plotting, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely thunderstruck. And this is the second time I've seen it at the skill yeah. of the lyrics mm -hmm. and also the musical inventiveness. Mm -hmm. The music all the way through here is is oh, absolutely yeah. astonishing. Yeah. Magnificent music. Yes. And you've got arias, you've got duets. It's in the tradition somewhat of Greek tragedy. I've thought that too. Uh, uh, it's every mm -hmm. now and then I feel that there's uh, people will re re reject that, but I also think there's there's a recognition at the end, and I think a cathartic effect at the end too. There's a rec you know, the, the classical requirements mm -hmm. of Greek tragedy are there. Oh yeah, I agree with you entirely. Plus, there's also the size of the character, the size yes. of his hatred. Yes, mm -hmm. he's not just a puny little. Uh, what takes it out of melodrama, I think, is melodrama, you get somebody who's puny or small <coughs> or not a real character. This particular character is a giant in it's hatred. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's where I think you get mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. uh, tragic concept. And the choruses, as you were suggesting, too. The use of the ensemble is so knit into the structure of the now piece. That's another thing mm -hmm. that's incredible, isn't it? This, and yes. some of those things, like the one when the uh, old beggar lady uh, sing City on Fire. Mm -hmm. Now that to me, that's not musical comedy. That is pure tragedy. That's mm -hmm. almost a great tragedy. And it's a brilliant song, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's true. What is this? Plume of smoke goes over the... Mm. Over the... Uh, <coughs> and there's a horrible... Well, we don't need to that's go into that. <laughs> yes. But uh, that cry, City on Fire, mm -hmm. is extraordinary. Yes. That's mm -hmm. pure, brilliant, tragic... Mm -hmm. uh, it is, isn't there, it? Of course, it goes back to the Greek. It's using a very old theatre form, which is the Greek uh, form, of course, as you say, the Greek tragedy. Yeah. And uh, oh, there's, there's so many. Uh, the letter kind writing. Of I think the letters, that quintet that sings the letter yeah. that Sweeney is writing, I think, is so elegant, elegant piece of music. Yes. There's another point where I have mixed feelings. You know, one feeling is I, I've never seen anything like this before or heard it. The other is I want to run for the door. That's Johanna. At the time when uh, the sailor, Anthony Hope, is singing about Johanna, mm -hmm. his love, and that's one of the most beautiful love songs Sondheim has ever written. And you, as Sweeney Todd, are up on the top there with your razor, and you're singing about Johanna. And I've now checked the stage directions, and at the end, when you're singing Johanna, the second syllable it says, he slashes the victim's throat in such a way that the victim's mouth opens 
as his mouth is open and Anthony Hope's mouth is open for the second syllable of Johanna. Makes you think, doesn't it? Oh! <laughs> 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 this is what saves the show. That's, <laughs> in, the the, that's in your yeah. performance. That makes you think. It makes me think I want to go home. At that <laughs> and I can't believe anybody could be that macabre. Who is that? Is that you, Wheeler's idea? Uh, no, I'd say it was Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim. Uh, uh, Stephen and, uh, and Hal, but I'd say Stephen. Mm. Stephen designs all that where as he's writing. He sees it, he pictures it in his mind, I believe. I do mm. really believe that all of that is designed by him. Mm. It's not I so. do, too, because mm -hmm. it's in other shows like Company. Mm. Uh, there's a cold brilliance there, and yet this same man can write Johanna, and there's another beautiful uh, melodic song in there. Oh, yeah. I forget which one. Pretty Women. Pretty Women. Pretty Women, women. Pretty pretty women. women that beautiful. you sing with the judge. With the there's judges. another case. That's one of the most, another one of his most beautiful songs. He hasn't written a lot of beautiful songs. He's written a great many brilliant songs. Mm. He always crushes, truncates the lyricism just to keep the pressure in. I think he mm -hmm. almost lets you have a beautiful line and mm. crushes it down. Yeah. It's, Sunday and the Clowns is one of the few that was. Yes. That's pure music and he mm -hmm. almost became sentimental on that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. rueful. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that uh, pretty women. And now the there's song. another case of the of the bifurcation of the split between what is brilliant and what is appalling. You are singing over the over the judge and you're about to cut his throat. And by the way, you certainly cut throats with a flourish, don't you? <laughs> with a swoop and then that <laughs> splashing part. That's another yeah. one that drove me. <laughs> it's, ra it's, it's rather gratifying. I have to tell you, you enjoy <laughs> that. Huh? Yes. Seems to me you added it. I don't remember Lenny Carrier doing that. <laughs> Does Hal Prince know you're enjoying <laughs> that? Flipping that blood around. Yes. Yeah. yes. No, right. but that song is another one, Pretty Women. And you and the judge. And we should give credit to the judge. What's Ed the name Lindek. of the judge? Ed Lindeck. Ed, Ed Lindeck. Ed Lindeck. Who Marvelous, plays the it? judge. Yeah. He's Marvelous. very fine, yes. And he's another one, by the way, who misses travesty or caricature. Yeah. Yeah. That's an old-fashioned uh, Dickensian melodramatic villain, but he yeah. never plays it that way. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a marvelous cast. I, I, I just think each one of those people Except so I told Angela before, the boy playing Toby in the beginning was difficult to mm. understand. You know the Cockney, we mm -hmm. discussed that before, mm -hmm. the Cockney is wonderful. And it seems to me, now you would know better than I, but mm. it seems to me the Cockney language in the play is authentic. It is, absolutely, mm. yes. All the way through those lyrics. Very carefully uh, laid in there, yeah. yeah. But the, it's Cockney idiom, so however you uh, try and clarify it and get rid of any kind of little sounds that might disturb the ear and uh, make it unintelligible, nevertheless the idiom is there and so you have to mm. get used to that rhythm, the Cockney rhythm. That's right, the rhythm. Now that, yeah. that's another wonderful thing about Sondheim. It seems to me, again, as an outsider, that the Cockney rhythm is there and that that's mm -hmm. part of the charm of those songs. And the boy Toby singing that, but he, in the beginning, I found it difficult, even knowing many of the lyrics, to understand him mm -hmm. until uh, we mentioned, we discussed that before too. Afterwards, when the boy Toby begins to discover what's going on in the cookout mm -hmm. and becomes angry, then I be able, began to be able to understand them. I wonder if you don't have to tone that. With you, it's, it's possible. Uh, you, you can be understood all the way through, Angela, because you've worked with American audiences for long. You know how to temper but it. But that boy's American. Yeah. That's an American lad, but he's very busily doing a very authentic a Cockney accent. And, yeah. uh, I think he's defeating himself a little bit by maybe making it too heavy. Yeah. It doesn't need to be that heavy, does it? Probably not. No, I don't think the so. The language is, is difficult in, in the play. There is such an overlay, and I, and I do think that, uh, that Stephen didn't necessarily mean that every word had to be understood because he wrote some very complicated two or three things oh, going yeah. on at once, yeah. particularly yes. with the sailor and Joanna, with Anthony mm. and Joanna. Those mm -hmm. patter songs are, yes. are something extraordinary. Mm. I still hear lines after six months that I say, oh, Lord, that's yes, funny. I know, mm. me too. It strikes mm. me out of the blue. Yeah. Another extraordinary thing, you know, just when you, as a playgoer, you're commiserating with yourself because of all this slaughter and bloodletting, blood you're absolutely astounded at the fact that he never uses a cliche. He writes love songs like Johanna and Pretty Ladies, 
there's nothing of, not only nothing of June Moon tune, there's nothing of any other lyricist in America. N nobody we've ever had has written like that. I keep going back to Gilbert and Sullivan mm -hmm. because some of it, but he moves away from Gilbert and Sullivan. They didn't write that kind of sincere lyric. By the way, another thing that uh, puzzled me a little bit is the girl supposed to be Johanna, a caricature of all the 19th century melodrama uh, heroines? Isn't I she think supposed she's to supposed to be Pinky. You know, I mean, she's, she looks <laughs> like Pinky, doesn't she? <laughs> and uh, um, I'm talking about Gainsborough's Pinky now. Yeah. I think it's or Romney. I forget which one. I think that's what the leads had in mind when they dressed her in the, the long wig and everything and the little bonnet, you know. Mm, but that wig is a little overdone, isn't it? At one but point, she's running around on one of those bridges. <laughs> oh, of course. But but then we're all overdone, aren't we? And in a sense, I mean, look at look at George's wig. You know, his curious kind yeah. of wild demeanor, my extraordinary red wig with the carrot horns, mm, the whole thing. We're all <laughs> very broadly drawn, I think, as characters on the stage. You c we're not drawn as stereotypes by the designers, but nevertheless, they have uh, had a very important function, I think, in, in working hand in glove with, Steve, uh, with uh, Hal Prince in mm. his overall concept. I mean, the set and our costumes all to go together like ham and cheese, you know, and... Uh, mm. It did, after all, spring um, from admonitory children's tales from, a, from mm. a fairy tale character, and I think they want yeah. to keep visually that distance. Yes, uh, the sailor, the, the you know, my pants like are too short, romantic and idea and of I think the we sailor. often look like little children uh, sitting there, uh, like yes. uh, the children's vision, a slight remove from yeah, that reality. realism. Mm. But the, the distance is, has to be absolutely right, and, it, and we can't, as you say, go too far. And, into uh, yeah. the, the, the melodrama or the... Or the, no. the yeah, but that's one of the things, again, to me, I, I'm going to use the word extraordinary once more, that's uh, all. Yeah. <laughs> one of the extraordinary things is that while you people are on the verge of caricature in performance uh, and in a costume, mm -hmm. and you're that wonderful hairdo you mm -hmm. have, mm -hmm. it never goes over the brink. It's mm -hmm. always essentially truthful. Mm -hmm. And now the sailor also, he's mm -hmm. a little bit of a starry-eyed romantic sailor. Yeah. He's just on the verge of being a goop out of one of the well, comic strips, like but the he innocent, isn't quite. Isn't what? he? Well, he's the, the innocent. That's right. But he's also got enough truth about it. Your theater's falling apart here. Here we oh, go. Right. <laughs> 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 he's a bill. respect him. Uh, you've got a razor <laughs> with him still. You bring those knives I again. I never go anywhere without them. <laughs> but, the <laughs> but the girl seemed to me to be in the way she was singing. Now, I don't mean to criticize the girl no, because no. everybody in that cast is exciting mm -hmm. but they can be off for one performance and I had the feeling that the wig was a little too much you suddenly you begin to wonder what everybody is up to are you doing here a, a uh, musical tragedy I know you don't like that word on the air <laughs> but are you doing a play a serious play or are you doing something that is going to be a comic cartoon strip you avoid it in performance. He avoids it in performance all the way through. Don't you have to be careful about every single one of those aspects in a play like this that's done in such tremendous detail? Indeed you do. But yeah. you said something just a few moments ago, which I think is, is in essence what we're getting at, which is we can be all of these things. We can be on the edge of caricature. Mm. But as long as we play it true and absolutely honestly, you're mm. going to believe us at that moment. Mm. We are not going to rock the credibility boat, in other words. Mm. Um, the minute we go over into that area of caricature, that bothers you because you want to become involved with these mm. people, even though you don't care for what they're doing. Nevertheless, you want to, as they say, empathize. You'll relate to them. Uh, I think it's a matter of degree. Uh, Betsy Jocelyn, I don't believe for a moment, intended to take it into a realm where you questioned her mm. honesty <coughs> and uh, of her characterization. But if she did, it's due to her trying to over-clarify the comedy that's contained in her lyrics, particularly mm. in her song with him, about kiss me and all that thing. Uh. I'm about to go for reticule, you've got a reticule. <laughs> you know, to try and get the meaning out so the audience will understand what she's saying. Mm. She over-articulates, um, I think. Possibly, and then the wig. And that's is not a. I'm not. I'm not uh, criticizing again. I'm not mm. criticizing. Well, I'm, I'm saying it's a problem <coughs> we all have mm. with these fast songs. Mm. 
And of course, she has to work. At one point, she's singing with him, with Anthony Hope, the sailor. Yes. Up on one of those extraordinary, that makes it, a, not, I've done extraordinary again. <laughs> extraordinary bridges that are moving. <laughs> She's way up in an enormous theater, so y you do have to push hard, yeah, don't you? Yeah, Could yeah. you find the uh, uh, size of the house, I mean the uh, ambience of the house right away in the no, beginning? No, no. It bogged me for, for a couple of days, personally. Yeah. Uh, I found it towards the end of the week, and then mm. I was at, at home and happy as a lark, and yeah. totally at home in the size. It's going to work in the It's going theater. to work like gangbusters. It's a superb yeah. theater because it has a shell feeling and it, it, it encompasses the stage mm. and uh, one has no sense of going off into a nowhere, which you do with some very large theaters. Mm, I hadn't thought about there that. There are boundaries enough. within yeah. this theater, even though it is vast. It is a theater and not just a big Oh, oh it's a oh, theater. Yes. It's a theater theater and I believe the audience are very comfortable in it. Yeah. How did you feel when you come on? You have to come on pretty uh, strong too in that very first appearance, don't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, here. Uh, yeah, I mean, in that, in that particular theater, because we're concerned about the, met the Metropolitan Center, you know, whether it's going to work with that new huge stage. Oh, it's going to work magnificently, I think, extraordinarily. <laughs> it's mm. going to work. You can um, use it. <laughs> I'm I through with it. I'm through with it. I'm, I'm going to keep, keep, <laughs> keep score here. Well, it's, it's terrific. Well, the, the, when I first come on, I think, for quite a while in the play, we can't really see that w much. I couldn't see, although in, when it, we'd gone in before, I could see the size of it. But when it, once I got out there, I went into a sort of, um, I, I couldn't tell how, I forgot how deep it was mm -hmm. when it was dark. And it was only as we got more comfortable in the play that, fortunately, that the, it got a little lighter and I began to see what, all those people. And uh, by that time, I was fairly lights. comfortable. <laughs> yes, the exit lights, which ah. are, it's very high this way, which is uh, nice because it makes us do, uh, I have a tendency to look down, made me look up a lot. Mm -hmm. The acoustics are, are very good. They, the balance for us on stage was very good, mm -hmm. so it feels intimate. I had the feeling right from the beginning. Now, I think the, the acoustics, the acoustical machinery was pitched a little high. It seemed mm -hmm. to me to be brilliant mm -hmm. in the sense that it was little, a little bit too high. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. But I did have the feeling that you were working to the whole house and that you were it was the whole house that you were able to find right away. I was astonished at that. Oh, good. You found it, and then I mm -hmm. thought you found it right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. You never worked in a house this big. Not mm. this big, but we'd mm. come from Washington, you see, from Kennedy. Yeah, but and that's only 2,200, 2,800 seats, oh, yeah. the concert. This is mm -hmm. 4,200 seats. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's the biggest it really is. Yeah. yeah. But it feels smaller. It feels, uh, it's unlike the Eurus even, mm. you know, which is yeah, smaller but feels bigger. <laughs> Okay, well, we've settled some of our differences. You've got an extraordinary <laughs> show. <laughs> and it's brilliantly done. Even well, though at times I find it very tough to take. Thank well, you both. You've been extraordinarily kind <laughs> to us. And thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I got it right back. I tell you. you have just heard Elliot Norton in conversation with Angela Lansbury and George Hearn. The stars of Sweeney Todd now playing at the Metropolitan Center. Mr. Norton is drama critic of the Boston Herald American and appears to the courtesy of that newspaper. Mr. Norton is also professor of dramatic literature at Boston University. Elliot Norton Reviews is recorded in the studios of WGBH Boston.